Ali knew it wasn't real. It was one of those baby dreams, but still a dream. The first thing she saw was a tall woman in a white dress. Her reddish hair fell like waterfalls over her shoulders. She floated in the air, surrounded by what it seemed to be a force field. Her eyes closed and her mouth slightly open. Defiant as ever, Alison tried to get close, but the more she wanted to reach her, the farther she went away. Frustrated, she stopped to stare at the floating beauty again. There was something familiar about her face. Her skin was almost translucent, with pinwits hugging her arms over the gown, wrapping her up to her fingers. Ali got distracted watching the flowers when the floor trembled and split in front of her eyes. An abyss arose between them, and something inside her, almost primal, screamed that she had to hold on to the sleeping lady. Alison ran to the precipice, like her life depended on it. But when she got to the edge, it was too late. The mysterious woman had disappeared. She blinked several times until her eyes got used to the daylight coming through the window. The warm spring days had melted the last traces of snow in Boston. Daffodils and tulips would bloom again soon in the streets and the people would start preparing for the most relevant event in the city, the annual marathon. The change of season was something that had called Alison's attention since childhood. Ever amazed by how nature regained ground in the city and how the tops of magnolia's trees would be reborn over the former white winter landscape. Of all the seasons, spring was her favorite. It wasn't like she didn't enjoy the winter, but Ali felt more comfortable in her hometown, Concord, and the spring break was the perfect excuse to return to her mother's house. Since she awoke, soft music and a sweet voice humming the melody filled the air. The smell of coffee in the morning was something that made her smile every time. Alison left the bed following the aroma to the kitchen. Good morning, she said, sitting on a chair. Hey, did you sleep well? Megan inquired with a knowing face before Ali could even speak. Uh uh, she denied, shaking her head while eating a toast. The nightmares again? The girl asked while serving coffee in a ridiculously giant cup. They had bought all the things for the apartment in a second hand bazaar back then when both girls got accepted in college. They fell in love with a set of cups that emulated the ones of Central Park from the TV show's friends. Mm-hmm, she mumbled under the scrutiny of Meg's gaze. Well, at least in a few days we can go home. Concourser helps you a lot with that. Ali only nodded to that. Speaking of home, Ben called. He returned from Rome yesterday. He's waiting for us to celebrate the full moon. Benjamin was Megan's older brother and Ali's first love. They were only 8 and 11 years old when they met, and from the first moment, Ben treated Ali like a sister. Although when the teenage years arrived, things got complicated. She was the first person to whom he confessed that he has no interest in the girls of the cheerleading team. Back then, the overexcited group had started a ruthless competition to get his attention. It was a waste of time, because Benjamin wasn't interested, neither in them nor in any other girl, because Ben's full attention was on a boy from his biology class. It was at that moment that all the illusions of one day having the courage to confess her love for him died in silence.
That day, she hugged Ben and gave him her devoted friendship, because that was the best she could do, and her friend deserved nothing less than that. Deep down, she knew that if her unrequired feelings had to transform into something else, there was only one option. If she couldn't be the woman of his dreams, she would be the best friend anyone could ask for. Celebrate the full moon? What are we supposed to do when he wants to celebrate the sun? Human sacrifices like the Aztecs? Meg looked at her, holding a mag with a big smile on her face. You know, I can always tell when the caffeine hits you with my sarcasm detector. Ali rolled her eyes. From a very young age, they shared something like telepathic communication. They only needed one look at each other to know without a doubt what the other was thinking. Their friendship had been a gift from the universe to Alison. She was sure that she wouldn't have survived high school without Megan. The awkwardness, in addition to the lack of sense in fashion or how to behave in front of strangers, would have put a target on her back that the bullies wouldn't have missed. Thankfully, Meg always protect her, and no one dared to do something that would put them on the blacklist of the McAllister siblings, if they wanted to claim the almost monarchical hierarchy of popularity in Concord, that is. Meg and Ben were the descendants of the first settlers in town, and almost all their family had been in politics and elected by the Concord population many times. The last name McAllister was synonymous with power and everyone knew it. It was like being born in a cradle of gold, one that their children will inherit, and then the children of their children, and so on. Marty McAllister, Benjamin and Megan's father, was the first to rebel against the family tradition by choosing a career as a historian that led him to travel the world in the 90s. On one of his trips to Rome, he met Magdalena de Angelis, the youngest daughter of one of the richest men in Italy, Arturo de Angelis. They married in secret three months later and escaped to a French town called Rocamadour, the home of almost 400 inhabitants. When Magdalena's father found them, Benjamin was nine months old, and there was not much else to do for Arturo other than accept his grandson. He was a family man, a traditional gentleman who had lost his wife too soon, leaving him with three daughters to raise. So when he first held his grandson in his arm, the feud he had with Magdalena was forgotten. They returned to Rome and three years later, on the afternoon of July 26 of 1998, Megan came into this world, making every person fall in love with her because of the beautiful green eyes and golden curls. Even more so, when a few months after her birth, one of her eyes changed its color. The former green that predominated in the McAllister family became blue. Back then, the doctors assured their worried parents that it wasn't affecting the baby's vision, so it was only an addition to her existing beauty. It was then when Martin's parents pressured their son to return to the United States. They didn't meet their grandchildren before because his mother feared flying. But Ben and Meg were five and two years old when Magdalena agreed to move to her husband's hometown after Arturo's death. His last wish had been for Ben to have his first and last name in addition to his father's. So, Benjamin Arthur DeAngelis McAllister arrived at the American land with no interest in speaking the local language until the age of seven. He could understand every word. But since a young age, little Ben always did things at his own pace. Megan, instead, had an easier adaptation. The new grandparents treated her like a princess, and soon she understood how to use that in her favor. Since then, Meg knew how to get what she wanted from people. 
And it wasn't just because of her supernatural beauty that had given her that power. It was because of her intelligence and that air of nobility that only comes with a combined pedigree of two influential families in their respective lands. Benjamin had inherited his grandfather's pale skin and black hair like his mother, a face for the cover of fashion magazines and a height that made him stand out everywhere. The Italian features could get both men and women melting before him. The D'Angeli's genes served him well in his mother's land. Arturo was a well-respected man in Rome, and his business continued to give profiters even 20 years after his death. The resemblance between them was so outstanding that people maintained their commercial agreements with the family. Of the features that Benjamin shared with his grandfather, the one that stood out the most was the green eyes. Those had been the permanent inhabitants of Ali's dreams since forever. That was what Alison was thinking when her phone started ringing. Mother, she groaned, heading to her room. Good morning, Mom. Why didn't you answer yesterday when I called you? You worried me. We have a deal since you move away from me. If I call you, you answer. If you can't answer, you should text me and call me whenever you can. How can I know that you're okay if you don't answer me with the things that happen in the news? At that moment, Ali left the phone on the bed and went to find what to wear in the closet. It wasn't like she didn't value her mother's concern, but Greta had always been overprotective, and that wasn't the first time she didn't answer a call. The fatalistic speech of everything bad that could happen will happen, Ali knew it by heart. In her humble opinion, her mother exaggerated. Nothing had happened to her in the three years she had lived in the city, so why would that have to change soon? The day the letter of acceptance from college came, Greta almost suffered a cardiac arrest. Ali never understood why. Her older sister Larissa had studied at the same university when she was her age and was one of their mother's greatest prides. The fact that she wanted to follow in her sister's footsteps hadn't been a reason to celebrate, quite the opposite. Greta was furious and forbade her to leave the house for two weeks. The situation got so out of hand that Megan's parents had to intervene. They explained it to her that the girls would stay in an apartment in the safest area of Boston. Also, Magdalena insisted that it was only a few miles that separated Greta from her daughter. The place had an extra room in case she wanted to visit them too. Ali had to promise her that she would always answer her calls, no matter what she was doing. If she didn't answer, Greta would go looking for her and bring her home by force. Grateful to Martin and Magdalena for their help, she tried to fulfill the promise she had made to Greta. But after a while, with the occupations of her studies and the freedom that adulthood brings, answering the calls from her mother wasn't a priority anymore. As a result, at least once a week, she was in a situation where Greta gave her the same boring speech, and as every other week, she would let her speak by herself, picking up the phone now and then, just to mumble some kind of assent sound. Sometimes, too tired of hearing her talk about the catastrophes that scourged the world and that, in her mind, would fall over Alice's head if she didn't answer her calls, she argued back. The most common tactic was throwing in her mother's face the fact that she had never acted like that with her sister. Other times, when she was running low in patience, the adoption topic and overstated sarcasm were her best emergency exit. It was like an ejection button for any discussions between them because Alison's mother never wanted to talk about her daughter's origin. 
When Ali was five, she realized that her features weren't the same as those of her sister and mother. The Asian lineage of her family had no resemblance to hers. For years, Greta only told Alison that she was beautiful as she was, that they loved her, and that it had nothing to do with her eyes or the color of her skin. Her dark red hair and olive complexion, opposite to the black hair and tan brown features of her family, was difficult to ignore. One morning, when Ali was eight years old, she sat down at the kitchen table for breakfast and asked her mother if she was adopted. The silence that came after that question only confirmed the obvious, and before anyone could say anything, the bus came to pick the girls to go to school. More than anything, Ali wanted to know who her biological parents were. However, after so many tries and no progress, the only use she could make of the lack of information was as an excuse to leave difficult conversations. It worked like a clock. So she kept using it, especially when the overprotective mother wouldn't understand that her daughter was a 22-year-old young adult living a boring life in a city that never felt like home. Alison was never one of those girls who would go to parties and end up having an extreme tolerance for alcohol by the time the college was over. She had spent her life reading books, enjoying nature, and sleeping whenever she could. Her dreams were always colorful and full of magic. They were like an escape, like her favorite stories. It wasn't a coincidence that she was studied English lit. Even Meg had given up on trying to drag her to parties in the first year. She understood that Ali wouldn't stop being the same person she had been in Concord just because they had moved away from their parents. For Alison, the anxiety and the lack of confidence was an enormous obstacle when you need to find a decent outfit to go to a bar on top of her aversion to crowds. They were just too different. While Megan showed off her curves and feminine shapes, Ali stumbled upon her baggy jeans and band t-shirts. Although she was thin and tall, with her long reddish hair that was very soft, the curves had never arrived during adolescence like the other girls of her age. Every encounter with the closet was a lost war anyway, and Greta had been yelling from the phone for a while, so she gave up and returned to the phone call. Mom, soon I will be there and you can scream at me all you want. But now I have to go to class, okay? The interruption worked to silence Greta for a moment. And then a sigh on the other side of the line was evident indication of a victory for Alison. <sighs> okay, we'll talk later. I love you. She drawled, defeated. I love you too, Mama. Ali dressed with the first thing she found, blue boyfriend jeans, a loose black t-shirt, converse, and a leather jacket that had been a birthday gift from Megan. Her bag was hanging close to the door, so she went out of the room in a hurry. The apartment was spacious, with a large kitchen, a living room with a huge flat TV that had been a housewarming gift from Ben, along with two small armchairs, and a large couch in front of a glass coffee table. Ali had taken care of filling it with plants because they had no access to a green space. May had agreed since they both had grown up in a place that overflowed with beautiful nature and landscapes. The change hadn't been easy for them in the beginning, but beyond that, the cohabitation had no major problems. Their friendship seemed to have grown even more since they were alone in the city. Ready for the last day of torture? Asked Meg, opening the door. As ready as I'll ever be, she replied smiling and hanging the bag over her shoulder. The two girls headed toward the elevator and then to the street. Ali walked oblivious to her surroundings when she noticed that Megan wasn't by her side. She turned and saw her looking across the street, eyes fixed in a tree in front of her. 
Meg, are you all right? What happened? Alison said, touching her arm. That got Meg out of trance. Yes, sorry, I thought I thought I saw someone from my glass. Don't worry, it's nothing. In silence, the blood girl started walking to the campus again, but Ali knew that something was disturbing her. She turned to see the tree that Megan had been looking at and saw nothing strange. However, her friend had seen a magical beam that carried a message. She remembered the first one she received many years before from a tall, beautiful fairy. Protect the girl with the reddish hair. Although that time it was different, not only because the messenger was a stranger for Megan, also because the message was a warning. They found her. Leave. Complete your mission. The destiny of the seven dimensions is in your hands. Megan insisted on walking Ali to the English department of Boston University, where she attended her classes, even when the law school was much closer to their usual path from the apartment to the campus. Something was going through her mind. Her friend never learned how to hide her thoughts, and although she tried to ask, the answer remained the same. Meg's mind was full of insecurities and worry, no matter how much she wanted to avoid that conversation, they would have to talk, and the truth would be out in the open. By the time the classes ended, the headache that hit Ali was so strong that for a moment she had to stop and sit on one of the entrance steps of the building. The migraines had begun when she was 12, the doctors had told her that it was a normal hormonal process of growth and that it would go away someday. It wasn't the case, and the worst part was that they were stronger every time. The pills she took were not always effective, and her eyes clouded more often. Ali knew that if she stayed there, she would get attention, and the only thing she wanted was to lay on her bed until the pain subsided. Alison tried to call Megan, but she couldn't see anything on her phone, so instead of waiting for her friend, she went home. After walking a block, Ali heard a noise passing her by, as if a bird had flown too close to her head. But when she looked up to the sky, there was nothing there. Her first thought was that it had been a product of her imagination. The headaches sometimes made her ears buzz, so she assumed that that was it and kept walking. Everything was normal until she passed in front of an alley and saw a shadow trying to hide behind a dumpster. Her entire body tensed, thinking that someone was following her. Ali turned and ran as fast as possible to the apartment. Once in her home, she took a moment to breathe deeply against the entrance. <sighs> and later, someone was putting a key in the door where she was still leaning on. Alison moved to let her friend in while she sank on the couch, clutching her forehead. Seconds later, a glass of water and a bottle of pills were over the table in front of her. Then she noticed that Meg looked pale. She moved her hand, taking something from Ali's hair. A feather. It was black with a lustrous green glow, longer than Megan's forearm. Whoa, how did I get to my head? She chuckled. Ali. Meg's hands were shaking. Hey. It's just a feather. I felt like a bird flew close to me on the way here. I didn't see it, though. Now we care about the scarce wildlife of Boston. She choked. Her friend was petrified, staring at the feather with wide eyes. 
How do you know I was here? Megan didn't respond. Instead, she turned and disappeared in, into her room. When she reappeared, she did so with a travel bag in her hand. Go back. We need to go now. Alison looked at her in disbelief and laughed. <laughs> Where do you want to go? Concord, we're leaving right now. But, Alison, go back or I'll do it for you. I'm not playing. No, you're not playing. You're just treating me like a child. We don't have time to argue. Please, just do it. No, tell me why we have to go like this. It doesn't make any sense. Noticing that Alison would not move off the couch without an explanation, she sighed and walked to sit beside her. Listen, I promise I'll explain everything when we get home. But for now, can you just trust me? Please? Alison saw the desperation in her friend's eyes and understood that it was better not to fight. With resignation, she retired to her room to pack. Just half an hour later, the two girls were walking to one of Megan's friend's house to leave the apartment keys. Someone had to take care of watering the plants while they were in there. Ali felt again that someone was following them, but that time she couldn't blame the headache since the pills had worked. I don't want to sound paranoid, but don't you feel like someone is following us? Megan's eyes almost popped out of their orbits. Stay close to me at all times. If you see anything abnormal, don't run, don't scream. Nobody can see you, okay? Alison nodded and walked faster. If it wasn't for the instructions she had received, she would have dared to ask. Meg didn't even ring her friend's doorbell. She just put the keys in the mailbox and took Alison's hand to cross the street. In the distance, they saw a taxi coming their way. That helped them relax a little, but the peace lasted only a few seconds until a very sharp shriek made the girls cover their ears. And before they could react, an enormous shadow with wings was over them. Alison didn't have time to turn around to see the wild animal. Before that, she heard Megan shout something she didn't understand, and what happened after that seemed taken from a superhero movie. A blinding light broke away from Meg's hands, tearing the creature apart in a second. <laughs> Ali couldn't stay silent when burnt feathers and a thick liquid like pitch fell from the sky. The smell was unbearable. Ugh, what the fuck was that, Meg? Disgusting. Mm, I think it got in my mouth, the girl complained, spitting on the pavement. Come on, let's take off these clothes. They walked around the corner until they found a dumpster. Megan undressed, throwing off her clothes, inside it, almost whining. I don't know if you noticed, know but we're on the street. I wouldn't undress if I was you, Alison said. Do you want to travel with shit all over your body? Go ahead, I won't stop you. Are you going to tell me what was that? Alison's stance was firm while watching her friend opening the suitcase wearing just underwear in the middle of the sidewalk. Yes, I will tell you, but first, can we leave before another one of those things shows up? There is more? Alison's voice became sharp. Oh yeah, so come on, change or walk, your choice. Oh. With a grunt of discomfort at the situation, Alison undressed too. She hated to show her body in public, 
something she had avoided a lifetime. Changing rooms, pools, or beaches with people who could look at her. And there she was, in her underwear, out in the open, on the streets of Boston. They arrived to the commuter rail station in a few minutes. After a much-needed visit to the toilet, they bought their tickets and waited for the train to arrive. The trip to Concord lasted less than an hour. They didn't talk much on the way there. Ali could almost feel the anxiety coming like waves from Meg. She had a thousand questions, but something inside her told her that if she pressed her friend, it would be worse than waiting for the answers. When the train made its stop at the station, they walked toward the exit, hoping to find Martin. But Ben was there. He was leaning on his 65F100 truck that he had restored years before and looked as if it had just left the factory. It was light blue with white lines on the sides. Benjamin wore tie black jeans, a pair of combat boots, and a purple t-shirt with a print of the cover of the slit albums cut. His hair was longer than the last time they had seen him, disheveled, so it fell on his forehead. He also wore a pair of black sunglasses that gave him an air of bad boy from the 50s movies. The wind moved his hair, and when he saw the girls walking toward him, the half-smile on his handsome face made Allison stumble on her feet. If it weren't for Megan's quick reaction, she would have fallen face down to the floor. Ben's smile widened. Watching his friend being the same awkward person who had survived high school out of luck without breaking a bone. Ali was embarrassed and flustered. She wanted to scream for her lack of natural balance. Welcome home, bitches! Benjamin shouted with open arms to hug them. Oh, oh. Both growled at feeling tightened by the impressive strength of the men. I can't breathe, Meg whimpered. Yeah, there are people who need their lungs to live, Ben, Ali complained. <laughs> he laughed before letting them go. Then they take their bags to put them in the back of the trunk while the girls climbed through the passenger door. How were your exams? The question made them growl again. Ben, we're on vacation. No more questions about college. Ali nodded throughout Meg's brief speech, clarifying that she shared the same opinion. Okay, okay, Jesus. I forgot that I should never have you both against me. They laughed together and changed the subject for more trivial things, such as the new fences of some houses they passed by and gossiping about former schoolmates who were pregnant or soon to be married. The first one to get off the truck was Allison. Her childhood home was a discreet house on a small farm on Sudbury Street. It looked like an English cottage surrounded by tall trees and a stone entrance for the cars. The wooden roof needed a renovation urgently, like most of the property. 
In front of it, there was a large deployed field and no neighbors close. Ben helped her with the travel bags until they reached the wide entrance door. Well, first package delivered, Ben said with a broad smile, tapping her head twice in a playful way. She punched him in the arm and then grabbed the edge of his t-shirt. I'm so going to steal this one. Ha! <laughs> Always looking for an excuse to get me naked. Alison watched them drive away with her cheeks on fire before stumbling over the suitcases. Mom? She shouted, closing the door behind her. Greta came from the kitchen with her arms open. My baby's home! She hugged Ali almost as hard as Ben had done before. I didn't expect you so soon. Ouch, Mom, you're hurting me, she bubbled, almost laughing. Greta released her and squished Alison's face. You look beautiful as always, but too skinny. Come in, I'm making teokboko tea and the kimchi you like so much. The smell of homemade food, the hug of her mother, the vast landscape through the window, and the house that held so many memories of her childhood was what she needed to forget about her studies and the headaches that had stressed her so much over the previous weeks, not to mention the unpleasant encounter with the giant bird. After the late lunch, the calm that reigned over the house was too much for Ali. Since her anxiety was over the roof, the desire to go and question Megan until she confessed was too strong to ignore. So she took her old bike to do the same path that she did every summer in Concord. The White Pond was one of the busiest places on summery days for its beach and clean waters. However, when she got there, only a few people were walking around. That bike ride had been therapeutic for Ali. She had developed the habit of closing her eyes and opening her arms while riding. Even when that had worn her a few scars since the route was a busy one, she had never stopped. It was like flying. The wind in her face, with the forest scents, had always given her a foreign feeling. One that on a few occasions had filled the ever-present void in her chest. Flying was one of her most recurring dreams. At six years old, Alison became obsessed with Batman. Greta couldn't remove the cape she had invented with a shirt tied around her neck for anything in the world. She even slept with the garment, and every time her mother had to take it from her to wash it, Ali would cry until she had it again tied to her neck. She used to say it gave her powers to fly and defeat the bad guys. No one had had the heart to tell her that Batman was just a man who needed a lot more than a cape to fly. The waters of the pond look, as usual, so calm that they reflected the sky like a perfect mirror. She walked to a small pier at the west end and sat there with her feet in the icy water. That pier was Alison's favorite place in the world, and the breath that touched her skin brought her the much-needed tranquility despite all the conflict in her mind. The dog's wood creaked under her body when she lay down to admire the clouds. Although she didn't know what that feeling in her chest was, it seemed to be something like yearning. A few moments later, Ali felt the vibrations on the pier as if someone was walking toward her. 
She turned her head and saw Benjamin barefoot with his jeans rolled up showing his ankle. Without saying a word, he sat down and submerged his feet in the water too. Alison felt how he lay down beside her, but she didn't move. They spent long minutes in silence, eyes closed, while taking deep breath. Ben reached out to put his hand on Alice's stomach for her to intertwine their fingers together, as if it was the most natural thing to do. That was the real peace for Alison, and even if it wasn't the way she would want to, she had learned to value the brief moments when Ben was hers. She knew it was a mistake, but after years and years of denying her feelings, in Benjamin's last visit to Boston, things had changed between them. Ali also knew that it was all platonic, and that her friend couldn't help being who he was. Only, sometimes, it was easier to ignore the elephant in the room than to accept that she was in love with someone who would never feel the same way about her. It was too painful, too pathetic in her opinion, but for better or for worse, the heart wants what the heart wants. I missed this, Ben whispered without moving. Me too. Rome has its charm, but there's no place like home, right? Tell me about it. When I got home, my mom was making kimchi. A loud gasp forced Alison to open her eyes. <gasps> Why didn't you tell me? I've had more wet dreams with your mother's kimchi than with Brad in Fight Club. Benjamin, that's gross. I'll give you a jar if you never say that again or any phrase that includes the words wet dreams and your mother in it. His smile was so big that it made her smile too. Deal. They stopped talking once more and the quietness of the moment caught them again. Without realizing, Ali fell asleep. Ben opened his eyes to see how her features had relaxed and her eyelids moved as if she was dreaming. In her dreams, Alison saw Benjamin sitting on a coffee shop, reading a book and holding a cup with the other hand. It was him, even though he didn't look like him. His hair looked perfect, combed back, with some product. He wore a black shirt rolled up on his forearms, dark jeans, dress boots, and thick frame reading glasses. He had a well-groomed beard and looked more mature, closer to 30 than the 25 years he was. Feeling Alice's presence, he turned to look at her, and a blinding smile appeared on his face. His eyes were bright like he was seeing his favorite person in the world. That was the look that she had always wanted to see on his face. So she knew it was a dream. Something so good couldn't be true. A moment later, Alison opened her eyes and Ben was staring at her. Except it wasn't the same. He had that sparkling eyes and the characteristic half smile, so she knew something was going on. You're drooling, he said amused. She got up in a fast movement and touched her mouth to corroborate that he was right. I fell asleep. Yeah, I noticed. Don't worry, my friend. The day you drool awake, I'll let you know. Ali looked at him with narrowed eyes while Ben stood up and offered his hand to help her. He had a mischievous smile that could only mean one thing. What did you do, Benjamin? She demanded, accusing him with one finger. Ah, oh, nothing bad. I just updated your pic on my contacts. 
he commented, turning his phone to show her a picture. It was her, sleeping over the wooden dogs, open-mouthed and drooling. Benjamin McAllister, delete that photo right now! Alison shouted as she tried to reach the phone. Make me! Ben yelled, running away from her. Ali chased him through the trees, holding on to her combers until they reached the truck. Both breathless, with dirty feet, and laughing like children. <laughs> Ben, if you show that picture to someone, I swear to God, I will tell your mom what happened to her wedding pictures. After hearing that thread, Benjamin was suddenly serious. It had been a rainy afternoon. Megan, Ben and Ali were boring, so they looked for an old monopoly. In his eagerness to start the game, Benjamin didn't see the photo album fall into a small bucket full of water. It had been there to prevent a leak to damage the wooden floor. By the time they finished playing and went upstairs to store the box, the album had drowned. Drying the photos with the hairdryer wasn't the smartest decision since the color moved in every direction. So the album ended up drying at Ali's house for a week until they returned it to the closet where Magdalena found it four years later, horrified. The leak was declared guilty and the case was closed. You wouldn't, he gasped. Oh, try me. Please, I beg you to try me. Neither of them looked away until Ben raised his hand in defeat. Okay, fine, you win. Now, can we leave? He deleted the image from his phone with a boat. My mother demanded your presence for dinner, and I'm sure we both need a shower. Ali smiled when she realized that Ben had loaded her bike in the back. They got in to make their way to Alison's house, both happy with each other's presence. Greta was at the front door when Benjamin and Alison strolled to the house. Hello, Mrs. Lee! Benny! I didn't know you were here. Ben smiled as Greta took his face between her hands. Look at you, handsome as always. Ali rolled her eyes at the exchange. Ben loved attention, and her mother had always pampered him like the son she never had. And you always look so beautiful and young. I need the secret. I need it. The girl coughed dramatically. <clears throat> well, while you two drown yourself in compliments, I will take a shower. Magdalena await us for dinner. After that, she entered the house, but not before hearing Ben. Green doesn't look good on you, Alison! When she came out of the shower with a towel on her head and another around her body, Ben was on her bed next to the suitcase. It was open and a bottle of limoncello liquor was in his hands. When she and Megan moved to Boston, Ben paid them a surprise visit two weeks later. He arrived with a backpack and a suitcase full of dirty clothes since he had been traveling for a few weeks through Spain and Italy. He gave them the TV and some bottles of the same liquor from Rome, with the promise of being the best limoncello they had ever tasted. It was delicious. However, once Benjamin returned to Italy, the wait until the next visit to get another bottle seemed too long. That was how, on a freezing afternoon, just before the first snowfall, the girls went out in search of a temporary replacement until Ben could bring the famous concussion. 
With a suspicion that it would never be as good as the original, they bought a bottle in a store that sold homemade pasta and sauces. The owners of the Italian store assured them that they had nothing to envy at direct products of the motherland. To their surprise, it ended up being much better. When it was time to go home for Christmas, they bought several bottles. And since then, they couldn't go through the door of the McAllister house without taking with them the famous Italian liquor made in Boston. On a dreadful twist of destiny, it was the same liquor that had caused the sudden change between the two friends. It had happened on Halloween night, the year before in the city. They got too drunk and too high, and things went out in no time. After that, neither wanted to be the first to have that conversation because they thought the other had been too drunk to remember what happened. So a month later... They both expected the other to speak first or never. Alison's thought went straight to that October night when she saw Benjamin lying on her bed with the bottle in his hands. He was admiring it like all the secrets of the universe could fit inside the glass. Ah, I see you still haven't lost the habit of going through my stuff without my permission. Ben smiled with his head low. Is that the case if it was in plain sight so anyone could see? Ali hoped that the whole situation didn't betray her nerves. The great love of her life was there, comfortable among her things, while she was only wearing a towel. She decided not to answer Ben's rhetorical question because all she could think was on finding something to wear as soon as possible. She put on her underwear while holding the towel. Ben had said nothing else and Alison didn't dare to look at him while she was still almost naked. The uncertainty was an unusual weight on her shoulders. Yet she couldn't act on it because that would lead to the talk she had been avoiding for months. As a result... Ali behaved like nothing was going on, and once she had jeans on, she turned her back on Ben and put a baggy dark green t-shirt over the towel. When she looked up to comb her hair in front of the mirror, in the reflection, she saw that Ben was no longer looking at the bottle, but at her. He had an indecipherable look on his face. Alison would have given anything to see something that could tell her that maybe there was something else there except it wasn't the case benjamin looked at her like she was a great enigma like he wanted to understand the reasons for her movements or what she was thinking while doing trivial things such as combing her hair clearing her throat ali broke the silence you can go ask my mother for the kimchi I promised you. I need to dry my hair and I'll be ready. Ben opened his mouth to say something, but stopped at the last second. He rose from the bed, leaving the limoncello on the nightstand. After that, he left the room without a word. The tension, however, lingered there, electrifying the air while she tried to breathe again. Alison went downstairs to find her mother and Ben chatting. He had two containers in his hands. Mom, stop spoiling him. One container was enough. Ben's hateful expression was lethal. Ali, don't be rude, Greta scolded. And thanks to that, Ben's face went from annoyance to smugness in just a second. Alison rolled her eyes before speaking again. Can we go now? You still have to shower and it's late. Ben hugged Greta with his free arm and headed to the front door. Thank you, Mrs. Lee. You're an angel. Ali took advantage of this moment to push him through the door. Hey! If you make me spill a single drop of this wonder, I swear you will pay for it, you evil woman. Ali made a mocking sound and they walked to the truck. Ha! Huh. How can I be evil if I'm the angel's daughter? 
she asked sarcastically. The two settled on the seat and then looked straight ahead, pretending to be thinking about something deep. It's a thought that doesn't let me sleep at night, he mumbled with a lot more than a hint of dramatics. Ali laughed and hit him on the arm while he started the engine. The McAllister house was stunning, almost from a fairy tale. With its entrance surrounded by trees, a space for several cars, a basketball hoop, a large porch, all of its windows were painted white, three floors of a light gray facade with a dark gray roof. The house had five rooms with in-suite bathroom, without counting the attic that was Ben's room. The kitchen and living room were the largest spaces, and Martin also had his studio at home. They had a multi-purpose room, but when their children stopped living there, Magdalena began using it to work and paint. She was a talented artist, and her paintings and stained glass work had been sold around the world by different galleries. Both Martin and Magda had an impeccable taste in art, and their home was the living example of that. The wall's decoration was tasteful. Many of them displayed artworks that both had collected over the years through their travels in Europe and America. The couple received Ali with hugs and smiles. They were like her parents, too. She has spent countless days and nights in that mansion since the age of eight. Bella mia, come stai? Magdalena told her, moving her hair behind her ear in a motherly gesture. I'm great. I don't have to worry about my studies for a few weeks. At that moment, Martin intervened. Ah, uh ah, -uh. we are forbidden to talk about that in this house, my dear, he warned with a smile. Ali laughed. Oh, I see. Megan made that more than clear, right? Yes, very clear, my princess, the blonde man said, moving his right arm over her shoulders while they were walking to the kitchen island. There, Meg was fighting with a cookie shard. The cookie shard seemed to be winning. Dad, can you help me with this? She whined, giving him the jar with a sad expression. Megan, dinner is almost ready. Don't spoil your appetite with cookies. Her mother scolded her. Magdalena was the only person who'd never fallen for her daughter's charms. Her father hadn't been that lucky. So he returned the open jar with a wink. I'll take a quick shower and be right back, Ben announced after leaving the containers in the fridge. Is that kimchi? Wondered Martin with hopeful eyes. Yeah, and it's all mine. Ben shouted as he climbed the stairs. Martin looked at the refrigerator with the same expression his daughter had used when she couldn't open the chocolate cook jar. Alison thought how both father and daughter had similar features, even more when they poted. Megan had inherited her charms from the McAllister side without a doubt. The dinner was excellent, and between talks and, and laughter, Everyone ended up in the living room having coffee and a chocolate mousse cake that was Alison's favorite. When it was 9 p.m., the parents retired to their room. Ben was lying on one couch scrolling through his phone, so Ali took the chance to silently ask Meg to talk with a cut nod toward the front door. She got the hint and both walked away from the living room. Well, we're ready in conquer, and you promised me you would tell me what's going on. So, no more excuses, Meg. What was the thing, and how do you make it burst in pieces? The blonde girl sat on the porch with a tired expression. Yeah, I promised, and I will. But I can't tell you here. 
I need to show you something about me that nobody knows and and won't be easy for you to see and hear. At that moment, Ali sat next to her friend without saying a word. I'm not sure how you will react, and you're my best friend in the world. I love you like a sister, and I wish that never changed between us. Because I don't think I can bear losing you. Alison didn't expect that answer, and in her mind, she couldn't find a single motive big enough to break the sisterhood they share. Meg, that won't happen. You'll never lose me. I love you too. Silence fell between them. The sounds of the night in Conquer hadn't changed in their absence. Can we meet tomorrow at the Walden Reserve? I have something to show you there, and I promise that I will answer all your questions. Ali knew that she wouldn't get more information from her friend in, at that moment. Fine. 9 a.m.? Meg nodded. I will ask Ben to take me home. See you tomorrow. Alison didn't sleep very well that night. The anxiety of learning the truth behind her friend's behavior kept her awake until the tiredness of the day won.